Finally, let's say a little bit about protein. So our focus so far has been on carbohydrates and lipids in this chapter. Um, proteins, this other type of biological molecule, proteins that are consumed in the diet are a great source of amino acids. It's just that are necessary for building other proteins in the body, proteins that we might need. So uh, sometimes we might eat more protein than we need to, or we might end up with more amino acids of one type than what our body uh, needs to make use of right in the moment. So in those cases, if we have some excess, then the amino acids can actually be used for energy as well. So our bodies are very good at doing these interconversions. The amino acids can be used for energy or they can actually be modified. They can be converted into carbohydrates or lipids. So different sorts of conversions, interconversions are possible. We're gonna see two types of conversions that can happen on amino acids. Um, but before we move on from this slide, okay, there are about 20 naturally occurring amino acids um, that our bodies need to make use of. And it turns out 12 of them we can build. Our bodies can synthesize them um, through different metabolic pathways. However, that leaves eight that we cannot synthesize in adults. So there are eight amino acids that we have to get in our diets. So this is why it's necessary to have a certain amount and type of protein, whether a person is a meat eater or a vegetarian, they still need to be getting um, these certain amino acids and proteins in order to have a, a complete diet. In children, there are actually nine of these amino acids that they have to consume in the diet. They can't synthesize. Histidine is the one that um, kids don't have the metabolic pathway to make it, but adults actually do. So a little bit of a difference there. These amino acids that we have to consume in our diets, these are called essential amino acids. The others, the ones that we can build from other starting ingredients, those are called non-essential amino acids. A lot of times we get these in our diet, um, but if we don't get them in our diet, it's kind of like we can, we can get by. We can synthesize them from other starting ingredients if needed. So what are some of the modifications and conversions that our bodies can do in order to build different amino acids two types of reactions we're going to take a look at here. Transamination, what this is referring to is taking an amine group, an NH2 group, and moving it onto a different molecule. So what we're looking at right here, we've got two molecules, glutamic acid, this is an amino acid, and what we're going to do is grab that amine group, swap it over here to this molecule, oxaloacetic acid, and when we do that, what we end up building is a molecule of aspartic acid. This is a different amino acid. So what we just did in this pathway is we converted one amino acid, glutamic acid, into another, aspartic acid. Okay, so transamination, that's one example of a, a modification that our bodies are capable of doing. We have an enzyme that catalyzes that reaction. One more example of transamination shown down here. Same idea, start with one amino acid, convert it into a different amino acid. The other thing that we can do is actually just remove an amine group. So this is called oxidative deamination. Deamination meaning we're removing an amine group. Okay, so in this case, what would happen is we start with an amino acid, remove its amine group, and in the end, what happens to that amine group is that it ends up in the in the um, in urea, which we will learn about later on in the semester. Urea is something that is a waste product that can be sent out of the body with urine. So coming back to this idea of excess amino acids, if we have some extras that we don't need to use for building blocks for proteins, um, then we can actually use them as an energy source. And what this is showing is just all of the different locations where different amino acids can kind of jump into these familiar cycles we've been looking at. So um, there are a number of amino acids that can be deaminated. Deamination reactions can tick off an amine group, and then these can be converted into the form of pyruvic acid. And we're familiar with pyruvic acid, that's something that can go and enter the citric acid cycle. Um, other types of amino acids can undergo different conversions and enter the cycle at different points. So this is something that, uh, just coming back to the question, do you need to memorize all of these? You don't need to memorize those specific locations, like I wouldn't expect you to know that 
leucine specifically can jump into the citric acid cycle from the very beginning, acetyl CoA. I'm not going to ask you that versus if it enters over here, um, but rather I would like for you to know the concept that amino acids can be converted by our bodies into forms that are able to enter the citric acid cycle, uh, which ultimately is for producing energy in the form of ATP. So that's what I would like you to, to take away from this. So to recap, Finally here, where we, we've been a lot of places in this chapter, but just to kind of pull some of the main ideas together, we started off talking about glucose, which can be stored in the form of glycogen. And certainly that's a molecule. Glucose is a molecule that can enter the citric acid cycle, right? It gives us lots and lots of ATP um, due to all of the, of the electron carriers that are generated and, and the mitochondria makes good use of them. It synthesizes ATP. Um, but we don't have to just use carbohydrates. If our bodies run low on carbs, then we've got en other energy sources like fat. Uh, triglycerides particularly are very energy dense molecules and those also um, can be broken down in order to provide energy, powering the citric acid cycle and electron transport. Kind of as a last resort, our bodies can use proteins for energy. Um, first choice is to use these as building materials, build proteins from amino acids, but again, if we have an excess, then they can be used to power the citric acid cycle. This is also something that's relevant if someone is literally starving, if they truly do not have access to carbs or fats in their diet, then their bodies would start to actually break down protein in order to, to provide energy, ultimately for the brain. Um, so the body has this really amazing hierarchy of things that it will protect, and pretty much the nervous tissue is the most protected, right? We don't want to be breaking breaking down um, nervous tissue neurons in our brains, we want to like save those. Those are super, super important. So the body will work through these other types of biological molecules first and sort of reserve the neurons, keep those safe. Um, and that's, that's kind of all I have to say about that for right now. So we'll pick up with these ideas as we go forward in the semester.